Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey. I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. So today, Friday, June 20th, we will hear the presentation, Planners and Planners, what planners need to know about creating a sustainable landscape for today and tomorrow. For technical help during today's webcast, type those questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I would like to thank all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible. And today's webcast in particular is sponsored by the Florida Chapter. For more information on this chapter and how to become a member, visit floridaplanning.org. To learn more about all of our chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. And to learn about all the divisions, planning.org slash divisions. Coming up on your screen is a list of upcoming webcasts. Just this morning, we secured our final opening for 2014, so it's a packed program for the rest of the year. Stay tuned and be sure to visit, visit utah-apa.org slash webcasts for more information and to register. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit planning.org slash CM and go to your dashboard. Select Activities by Provider and remember to select APA Florida Chapter and select today's session, Planners and Planters. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for certification CM credit. For availability of DECM credits, Check the webcast webpage at utah-apa.org slash webcast. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash webcast presentations. Here, you can also view PDFs of our previous presentations if available. Now, I would like to quickly introduce our three speakers so that we can get the show on the road. Eric Power will be speaking first. Eric Power AICP is the principal planner for the City of Sunrise, Florida. Currently, he is the Secretary for the Landscape Inspectors Association of Florida, a statewide association that provides education and accreditation for landscape inspectors and other industry professionals. Mr. Power is a certified landscape inspector with LIAF. The City of Sunrise received the 2013 Friends of the Urban Forest Award for Outstanding Urban Forestry Program Large Community in part to a new landscape manual and code changes designed to provide easy to understand information to residential homeowners, as well as provide sustainable landscape provisions for redevelopment and aging sites. Laura Sanagorski, now Laura Warner, Dr. Laura Warner is an Assistant Professor of Extension Education in the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication and the Center for Landscape Conservation and Ecology at the University of Florida. Her areas of focus include social marketing and program evaluation. A horticulturist, certified arborist, and past extension agent, she earned bachelor's and master's degrees in environmental horticulture from the University of Florida and her doctorate in agricultural leadership, education, and communication from Texas A&M University. Dr. Warner's extension program focuses extension and educational outreach professionals. Ted Kozak, AICP, is the Zoning Administrator for the City of Green Acres in Palm Beach County, Florida. 
Ted has over 15 years of public agency plan making experience for the cities of Sacramento, California and Green Acres, Florida. He is an ISA certified arborist and APA certified planner. Prior to planning, Ted was a project manager for the home building industry in Sacramento. Ted was the principal author of the updated Green Acres Landscape Code in 2011. So without further ado, I am going to transfer the screen over to Eric Power, who's going to do a quick introduction, and then we're going to get things started. So Eric, it's off to you. Thank you, Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Power. Um, as you'll see on their screen there, it shows Eric Ted. Uh, Mr. Kozak is here in the same room with me today. Sustainability is and has been for some time the hot topic in planning, how we can prepare our communities for tomorrow. And if you're like us, you spend a good amount of your day putting out today's fires and not enough time planning for tomorrow. This is why it's important to have the conserva conserva conservation conversation that we are having today. So that landscaping is not lost in the sustainable discussion. After all, what is more sustainable than a tree? They can live for hundreds of years. They provide us so much from the vital task of producing oxygen to animal habitat to the simple beauty they bring to our communities. Today we hope to give you a comprehensive view of the role of a landscape in the planner's life. We hope that the information is helpful in decision making and the points made today will give you tools that you need to include landscaping in your community sustainability plans. But before we begin, I just want to take a brief moment to tell you about the organization that was able to bring you this webinar today. LIAF, or the Landscape Inspectors Association of Florida, is an organization that provides education and certification training to those who work within the landscape field. We are the champions, so to speak, of the Florida Grades and Standards. This is a guideline put forth by the state to ensure that quality landscape material is used. It covers everything from trees to palms to shrubs. Our members are anyone from landscape inspectors, nursery owners, installers, property managers, code officers, landscape architects, master gardeners, and yes, even planners. Now just for some fun, uh, here are some of the problems that we see out there doing our inspections. Everything from hat rack trees and poor root systems to, uh, well, I really don't know what to say about these slides other than sadly, yes, they are real. Um, and anyways, with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Laura Sanagorski. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for sharing part of your day with us this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the planner's role in landscape sustainability and specifically how the human element plays into um, sustainability. Before we get started, I always like to know who I'm talking to since we couldn't really shake hands and introduce ourselves at the beginning of this webinar. Um, so we have two quick polls just so we can get a feel for um, who you are. Um, so if Christine, you could please put the first one up. Um, we'll just ask you to respond really quickly. Our, our numbers are still moving around, so I'm just going to wait for one more moment just so that we can make sure that everyone's able to vote. Okay, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. Okay, interesting. So, um, just wanted to see what some of the major environmental concerns are in your community. And um, it looks like water quality is a huge one for three quarters of you. But um, not far behind that are water quantity and uh, air quality, erosion, and wildlife habitat. Interesting. Um, and real quick, we'll do one more poll, if you could please, Christine. 
um, if you could tell us about how your role has changed in the past five years, if it has. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it. This one is very clear. I suspected it might be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Christine. That is interesting, um, not particularly surprising to me, but um, I guess we could say that the majority of you that are participating today have a lot more responsibilities than you did a few years ago. and. Um, also, you've got some major environmental issues, so um, have a few things in common. Um, I also suspect that many of you are on this webinar because your new responsibilities include uh, landscape review. So anyway, um, thanks for participating there. So the planner's role in landscape sustainability, um, you might or might not see yourself this way, but um, when, when you're working on uh, landscape planning projects, you really are a community change agent and you have the opportunity to uh, make a lot of changes um, in a positive direction towards sustainability, but that comes with understanding people, uh, which is not always easy. And as you know, you're required to be a subject expert, but you also have to wear a lot of hats. So a couple definitions of sustainability that I really like, but uh, sustainability is retaining good characteristics of the existing situation and improving undesirable or poor characteristics. It's also improving the quality of human life while living within the carrying capacity of supporting ecosystems. So I think these are two that really represent what we do in the landscape. And this is what we're up against here. Um, this is. A, uh, an example from Florida, but we've got some, some great native vegetation. We go in and we take out the great vegetation and, and the wonderful native soils, and we put back in much smaller versions of you know, what we may have taken out. So this is not necessarily the most sustainable uh, way to go about things. As we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, landscaping really does affect the environment. And both the initial design, as far as what is installed and planned, um, through how the landscape is managed, affect everything from water quantity to water quality, uh, availability of wildlife habitat, and air quality. So uh, when we look at planning a landscape for the future, these are things to keep in mind. I'd ask for a raised hand if we were all in the same room together, but uh, just an example here of, uh, of a water quality issue. Um, if you notice, these uh, landscapes here, well, the lack of landscaping here has caused some water quality issues in this picture that are visible from uh, very far away. So anyway, the planned landscape and sustainability. When we design landscapes, we're really contributing to the quality of human life, which is a pretty important role to play. And there, there's a, just a plethora of information on the, the benefits we get from well-designed landscapes uh, as well as trees. These benefits range from food to reduction in crime, actual money savings, um, increased dollars spent in an area, um, social interaction outdoors, emotional and physical health, and emotional security. And uh, a, a good environmental image gives its possessor an important sense of emotional security. He can establish a harmonious relationship between himself and the outside world. So that's what we get to do when we design landscapes, is provide these benefits. Uh, adults and children have been found to spend more, times, more time outdoors 
in well-designed landscapes. Uh, they result in so stronger social ties and an enhanced sense of safety and sense of place. Trees and other natural features help to create and maintain a sense of place. That is a feeling of identification and belonging that is important to people's enjoyment and well-being and to the process of community. So when you're working with a very diverse group of people, there are a number of things that come into play with what they're going to ask for. And you can keep some of these things in mind when you're dealing with uh, the residents that you work with, your colleagues, your supervisors, administration, um, because there's a lot of things that go into play and it's not, decision making is not always black and white as to what is sustainable. So I'll tell you about a couple of these. Decisions are mitigated by these unseen barriers and benefits. So whatever um, behavior we're talking about that, that we want people to adopt uh, to be more sustainable, there are these unseen barriers and, and benefits that are going to come into play. And the, the key is that they're unseen, so we have to kind of be detectives. They can be perceived or real, and they can be internal or external. And what it comes down to is people may not adopt sustainable practices for certain reasons. They might not be aware of something. They might think that the barriers are too great. They might know about it, um, but they think the benefits to the way things are currently being done um, outweigh uh, the benefits to changing. Or maybe they don't know about it. So um, just an example here, um, let's talk about a, a new behavior, which would be removing turf grass and installing native plants. I suspect many of you that are on today um, might, might deal with this as uh, a means to use less water in the landscape. So uh, that would be the new behavior. The existing behavior would be to continue to maintain the landscape as it is. So every person might have a different set of these, but you'll have perceived benefits and perceived barriers. Some of the benefits a resident in your community might perceive to doing this is increased wildlife habitat, more color in the landscape. Uh, some of the um, barriers that they might see to this behavior is that maybe they don't understand the benefits or they're concerned about a loss of usable space. So as a change agent in the community, what you would want to do is to try and understand these barriers and benefits and to help encourage a change to more sustainable behavior, you would want to enhance the benefits to, to making this change and reduce the barriers. So for example, um, you could educate on the benefits of installing native plants. Um, likewise, the existing behavior, there's a set of perceived benefits and also a set of perceived barriers. And so um, you can use these and use an understanding of your audience and, and clientele to help encourage behavior change. A second factor that mitigates decisions is that of social norms. And I thought that this quote uh, really just kind of says it best, but the promotion of a cultural norm through mass media and marketing material that focuses on the desirability of a neat and weed-free lawn rather than beautiful outdoor landscape is almost certainly responsible for yard care practices that threaten the environment and also reduce homeowners' ability to enjoy the benefits of nature. So social norms really play into the decisions that we make every day. We want to be approved of and um, we want to do things that those around us are doing. And this is a cartoon I like that, that kind of I think is a, a good example of this, but you know, sometimes we have this idea that we're all we're all going green and, and doing what our neighbors are doing, but it's maybe not the most sustainable thing. So I think this is a good example of that. There's been a lot of recent research on social norms recently, and there is a very strong predictive relationship 
um, related to what a person's neighbors are doing. So um, they've shown an intention to uh, install a rain garden um, associated with social norms within a community. The, the people who thought their peers approved of installing a rain garden were much more likely to do so. And another study has looked at those preferring environmentally sustainable designs are those whose neighbors had environmentally sustainable landscapes. So it's important to keep in mind that, that our, our clients and the people that we work with are, are really looking to their neighbors. And this is kind of interesting. Homeowners preferred landscapes that matched uh, broad cultural norms, but they're more likely to go with what matches neighborhood norms than cultural norms. So um, what this comes down to is you want to look at the, the small scale, the neighborhood, because that's where the, the relationship is the strongest. And really, there's a social support needed to encourage new behaviors. So, um, I, I mentioned this kind of already, but uh, one of the best predictors of whether a respondent um, does certain tasks in their landscape, such as applying chemicals or, or doing maintenance himself, has to do um, with what they believe, what the resident believes their neighbor does. So using a social norms approach to encourage more sustainable behaviors um, would mean that we publicize uh, sustainable practices that are being done in the neighborhood. Um, this can be done through signs and um, other ways to emphasize this positive social norms and make it more visible within the community. Um, fear plays into a lot of our decisions uh, here in Florida. We deal with a lot of hurricanes, and each of you has your own natural disasters that you deal with, but uh, we see a lot of folks make decisions based on fear. It can be valid fear. It could be fear of change. It could be misplaced fear. Um, one of my favorite examples. Here's another hat rack tree for you, but um, we see people doing this all the time, and it's this fear of damage from large trees on one's home or property that leads to unsustainable practices. Um, we know a lot of people call this a, a hurricane cut, and they think it's something that is going to make them safer. Uh, the way that the tree actually regro regrows after cutting it this way makes it more dangerous, and um, people have been very se severely injured because of practices like this. And um, so that's, that's a, an unsustainable practice sort of driven by fear. And um, I always like to share an example um, from a village in India that planted all these trees. And uh, when the tsunamis came through, um, they planted all of these trees to break a world record. When the tsunamis came through, or the tsunami, um, they sustained pretty much the least amount of damage in this area because of all the trees. So um, the trees can actually um, protect you from storms when they're planted properly. So um, fear definitely plays into it. Um, stages of change is something else that uh, mitigates dis decisions. Uh, just something to keep in mind, people are in different stages of change related to specific elements of sustainability. Um, so it's not black and white, they either do it or they don't. Um, someone may have no awareness or intention to do something, and that would be a pre-contemplation stage. So if you're trying to encourage some element of sustainability, um, your goal would be to raise awareness so they can actually contemplate that change. Um, it, it's good to, to understand that people are in these different stages and understand that there, there's steps that would be taken to um, adopt a more sustainable behavior uh, in the landscape. Something that can encourage folks to be more sustainable is uh, a technique of commitment. So when we ask people to do something, it changes the way they see themselves. And it works because we as people love to be reliable. So this is something that uh, can be used to help encourage sustainability in your local communities. 
and I won't have time to go into this in too much detail, but I wanted to close my section with just a quick example that I love. Um, I'm sure we probably have people from Maine on here, and I wish I could see who you are, but this is an example that I love from uh, the town of uh, Camden, Maine, which is a beautiful place. But they're encouraging town residents to pledge to have chemical-free lawns, and they're using social norms and this idea of commitment to encourage um, this element of sustainability. And you can check out their, their website, um, but here's a map that you will see all over this little town, and the green indicates um, the properties that have pledged to have chemical-free lawns. So, it's pretty interesting. Um, this encourages the social norms because you can see that your neighbors are doing these sustainable behaviors. Um, and it's also an element of commitment because uh, you're up there on the map if you've committed to do this. So pretty interesting. So just kind of in summary on my part, um, I just went very quickly over a number of elements that sort of are playing in the background when people make decisions about sustainability. But um, as planners, you have the opportunity to act as change agents as well as subject experts. But it's important to understand the, the people side of things, too. And um, people act or don't act based on these barriers and benefits, norms, fear, stages of change, and commitment. There's some others. Um, but, but you're really in a great role to um, encourage sustainability by affecting the community's time spent outdoors, social ties, sense of safety and place, and um, emotional and physical health. So with that, I will thank you for your time, and I will turn this back over. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for all joining us today. This is Ted Kozak, City of Green Acres, and uh, just wanted to give you a little disclosure. Right now I'm fine, but if I pause for a moment, it's, um, I've had some issues of coughing uh, lately, ever since last Thursday, going to the Miami Heat game, losing my voice, and, and we also lost some other things. Just made some enemies right now, I guess, but uh, so that's my disclosure. I want to spend a little uh, time here. Uh, first off, Green Acres in Palm Beach County is a city of around 40,000. Um, uh, Green Acres is on a lot of major thoroughfares, so uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, commercial development, uh, a little more, even more than cities of a similar size. Um, wanted to spend a little time uh, introducing technical aspects of landscaping planning and planning realm. Um, like Laura just talked about, um, you know, more of the um, psychological effects, fear, the like. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about are more hard numbers. Um, most of us can recognize difference between well-designed and um, landscape and a poor one. Um, you know, like this, what I have up here on the screen, an example we know on the left, uh, that, that looks ugly. Uh, on the right, how do we get there? How do we, you know, with the challenges of power line, as you can see by the roadway, um, this, Simple things to do to just uh, bring properties a little, little uh, better looking. But how is this important for sustainability uh, in the environment? Um, it, so basically, the I'm going to give some following um, tips and um, how just to get long-term sustainable landscape. Uh, this isn't a new concept by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I like to bring up some of the, uh, the planning history. I, in uh, South Florida, I helped teach the AICP uh, uh, planning exam um, and twice a year on plan making. So I like to bring up things like uh, Ebenezer Howard, Garden City, 1898. He, he, it's basically it was a pushback, an alternative to all the crowdy, ugly, unhealthy cities. As you can see here, you know, providing, um, like Laura talked about, <coughs> psychological benefits and 
producing things uh, such as crime, uh, for example, just, just due to the psychological uh, parts of that. Um, also, planning and landscape integration um, originated back when with Olmsted and Elliott way from the turn of the century. Um, it basically all recognized the importance of green spaces, how these places were sustainable in terms of population and environmental balance. And um, also another uh, uh, key uh, person in the planning realm, uh, Kevin Lynch, in image in the city, um, just uh, touched upon lately. It's, it's, you know, I'll talk a little uh, further on, but um, uh, the APA has been bringing this up uh, a lot uh, lately. Sustainability, the next year's con conference in Seattle will be um, heavily involved in that, uh, as well as the, the, the most recent uh, planning magazine. Um, it, it talks about things and, and refers back to Kevin Lynch, uh, the importance of landscaping in terms of paths, edges, districts, nodes, and landmarks um, for a vibrant and healthy city. Um, basically, that makes a sustainable city. Uh, and as Laura talked about fears and um, the psychological benefits, of people define, define their spaces based on their landscape. So basically, not only trees or a tree can be considered a, you know, a landmark for people, but it uh, provides districts um, and also uh, definable edges in, in cities. Um, the uh, poll that Laura uh, conducted obviously reinforces what I'm uh, bringing up here. Uh, I'll have expanded roles as a, a planner, um, uh, basically where the, the key for uh, a lot of the uh, Clean Water Acts the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, shared responsibilities with um, unfunded mandates in a lot of these agencies, and it all trickles down to the to the local and regional planner at times, um, even in the private industry. Basically, planners are the advocate for the sustainable management of these resources, and um, we are stewards of the environment. And we, uh, with uh, changes in public policy and individual behavior. Um, Landscape involvement is one of those means of responsibility. As, as I talked about a second ago, um, the APA has been, um, you know, for, for many years, but even more recently, um, basically had a role, uh, made this a priority. Um, for example, this uh, a portion of this policy document from 2000 talks uh, directly on um, the biodiversity of the national environment. Uh, contributions that it makes in human uh, life, things that w we were talking about earlier with uh, Laura, uh, as well as um, our, our objective to sustain the ability of natural systems, provide life-supporting services, um, it, and they're rarely counted by ec economists. Um, but you know these things are all um, make up to the gross human economic product more than we know. Um, and once again, I'm going through my emails yesterday and uh, yesterday's um, APA monthly blog on sustainable and sustaining uh, places. Uh, there was uh, health beyond healthcare and discussed uh, things like open spaces, tree canopies, and other concepts associated with positive health and outcomes. So um, it really a lot of overlap going on. So how do we get here? Uh, one tool for us to become more sustainable is right tree, right place. Um, choosing plants that suit the existing site conditions, as well as uh, minimizing fertilizer, pesticide, and water use. That's all key. Uh, that's what sustainability is. Uh, planners can use their knowledge about the site, make sure appropriate plants are being planted. I'm, I'll talk about a little later on um, how we can um, you know, do this. Planners conduct uh, these landscape inspections later on. Um, and after installation, hopefully or, or right after and uh, immediately after a few months later, just to make sure these issues do not become a problem in the future. There, there's a, you know, visualize a street, any street you, you drive on. Um, it's key to have, you know, drainage plan, review and coordination, other departments. Um, we just need to imagine the ultimate size of the mature tree, not just the current size. Here, we're seeing more of the, the, uh, the mature size. Trees don't grow as large as they do in the natural environment. 
However, they, they still grow. Trees are living organisms, so we need to plan for it. Um, we need the adequate space to grow, and the bare minimum is seven feet clear. Um, a lot of tree species need a lot more than that, but even um, our, our new parking code requires 10 feet in terminal islands and parking lots. It, at the very minimum, giving room to grow. Um, basically, in the future, if this isn't um, done, we eventually have to remove these trees due to conflicts, and here we start all over again. We're, we're, we're basically um, not doing what we're trying to achieve. There are um, a lot of things that affect the health of the tree. Um, basically, roots and limbs. Um, there's commonly overhead power line, utility conflicts, sidewalk, paved areas. Um, a great reference book I like to bring up is um, Up by Roots by James Urban, a, a, a landscape architect. It, it's obviously very technical and very thick, but uh, flipping through it, pick up a lot of tips, maybe going through and, and um, uh, making a zoning code amendments, uh, and, or even just uh, making policies that discusses basic soil science and tree biology, um, planning and implementation, uh, landscape design. Um, it's just important to realize the area beneath the ground, the root zone, which this book is talking about, is just important, is important as the overhead space. Um, and according to the ISA, the International um, Society of Arboriculture, as many as 80% of landscape plant problems may originate below the ground in the root and soil system. So obviously that's the main concern. And here we can see the uh, Greenville, South Carolina Main Street. Uh, James Urban was uh, helping uh, reinvigorate, if you will. Um, Main Street was designed in the 70s, and at the time trees had been uh, going into decline basically due to these tree wells not being sufficient in so, uh, size uh, back in the 70s this thought wasn't going into providing room as we do today. Um, so in, instead of costly and time consuming repairs and replacement projects, doing it correctly the first time uh, is far more efficient and um, hopefully that you know, we can help trigger a little bit of this in your mind as we go today. Um, an example we see all the time, um, planning for the mature canopy and, and root space, uh, sidewalks, uh, we're constantly seeing them being lifted. Uh, the seven-foot rule would be nice to, to get. There are other ways around that. If you cannot, you know, these uh, green uh, spaces between the sidewalk and, and the curb line, um, you know, maybe provide some root zone protection and the like. But in the end, trees will find a way. And then on the right, um, planting trees with lower uh, mature heights uh, are important under power lines. Uh, in South Florida, we have, you know, uh, the uh, we're blessed with a lot large range of trees available that maybe we have more of a selection. But any in any environment, they, there's the possibility. Um, so basically, later on, we reduce conflicts uh, by pro providing with flexible material. Um, and here's an example: I was walking around Key West last month. Um, concrete sections of sidewalks that have been replaced with rubberized material to protect the root zone. Um, I know uh, all of you, when you go to Key West, you take pictures of sidewalks like me, but um, I, I, I noticed this. They, there's a, a, a large large role in the tree canopy there, and it's very important. So uh, one way to get to this point is uh, replacing sidewalk base and sub-base with structural soils. Um, I'll, I won't get technical on this other than it's a way to make man-made solutions on uh, compaction and, um, and providing more room for the roots to grow. I know we all see this kind of thing, right to right place. Well, this, the power company has to come in and, and make um, drastic um, amendments to the crown, and over time this is going to, well, it's already a problem, but you know we see this in every city. Um, we need to plan for it up front, yeah, and then utility companies are forced to come in later and make a natural pruning. Um, no matter where you are, we you know, recommend native, not uh, non-adapted species. Basically, non-adapted means is you know anything that was um, not here before Columbus came. Uh, uh, 
So typical things that we find, the soils don't match the tree species that are in the ground. Oaks with nitrogen deficiency here on the left and alder with phosphorus. Um, typically, you know, there's the nutri nutrient deficiencies are related back to high pH soils. Um, queen palms, they're from Brazil, they, they show basically uh, uh, manganese and magnesium deficiency uh, giving uh, dead tops. Basically, since roots um, require oxygen to conduct uh, biological processes to grow, um, and most uh, roots grow within the first 18 to 36 inches uh, of the, um, basically the top of the, uh, the root zone, it, it's critical to plant trees at or slightly above the uh, grade. Here you can see the, the correct way in the left, the first order root, they're a little slightly above, but uh, planting them too deep on the right basically um, will suffocate the roots and eventually decline and die. It's not going to take long. During planting, um, straps and supports, uh, they strangle the trees. Here you can see on the, the right. Um, strap removal should occur less than a year after installation. just depends on the storm season. But um, many publications, including the ISA, does not even require or mandate staking. There's a lot of times if it's a native tree, I, I, I really don't need the, uh, for a pine tree to be staked. It, it's, it, a lot of times people do not come back and take them away and eventually the tree just, uh, it's it, irreversible damage. Um, and, and again, here's the root ball. Um, you know, don't pile a, a bunch of mulch on top of the, the root zone um, during, right after planting. Um, a little bit of the root ball above the ground and um, the the, the native, the, the parent soil uh, actually, you know, excavate as little as possible, but uh, as wide as double as the root ball. Um, and of course, um, you know, if we're out there, whether you're in the private industry or even just being a watchdog for during a uh, landscape inspection or, uh, or even during the, the site plan process, quality landscape begins with uh, quality plant material. Um, most I can't say most, but a lot of states um, have the state grading programs, and, and if, if not, you know, it, it's worthwhile to create landscape codes that um, create state grade number one or better um, codes. Uh, like the state of Florida has a book, the Grades and Standards um, Regulatory Document, which um, has practical and research-based information about quality of, of trees, shrubs, and other landscape plants. Uh, there's a lot of other states like California, Illinois, and, and Texas uh, that have uh, strict guidelines for nursery stock. I, I just check into that if your state does not. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a great way to um, start at the beginning. During construction or planning for it, on-site uh, tree preservation is critical. Uh, I mean, it relates back to the root zone during all phases of construction. Um, protect them from mechanical damage. The, it, it will basically uh, kill off the, the means for uh, producing um, energy and, and nutrients for the, the tree and uptake. A minimum, minimum one to ten distance ratio for the construction fan. So uh, if it's a, a one foot diameter a tree a ten foot feet away from that um, trunk for protection, but the drip zone is really the, the optimal uh, location here in the right is a uh, tree preservation survey and a protection detail. You know, a typical one. Just feel free to copy one from somewhere. And then um, later on, it, it's what we call um, ma with uh, managing pests responsibly, uh, implementing uh, integrated pest management program. Um, it's just as simple as uh, for us planners to be aware that once the project is approved and the construction completed, um, that there is still more to be done. You know, optimally, we want to follow up. We want to um, uh, allow others to reduce and um, uh, manage uh, costs and maintain healthier landscape. You know, if it, you're able to monitor and um, on a regular basis, you know, no matter what you're doing, just don't wait until the plants are obviously under stress to the point of decline, um, which then will require 
immediate and usually drastic um, overuse of chemical applications so, such as pesticides. So things as simple as uh, conserving with um, using beneficial um, insects or even um, other uh, organic means that you know even using um, organizations such your your um, or your state extensions will be key. So planning and leaving room for uh, recycle waste, um, just leaving grass clippings, leaves, compost, on-site re and returns nutrients to plants and reduces waste. Um, you know, leaf litter is uh, free fertilizer. Back in the the forest, way way back when, before there was um, you know urban landscapes, this is how. Uh, nutrients were were recycled and mixed in. There was no need for fertilizer. Obviously, we recognize the uh, the current um, situation that not as feasible in all locations, except maybe a park. So, um, again, post project mentioned practices are key to long term viability, as well as reducing the uh, constant plant replacement. Uh, we can encourage landscape waste to be recycled. And, the key is to save money, increase the health of plants. And now here's something that we're, you know, at least I see uh, uh, almost on a daily basis. And if not, um, it'd be something for you to get to know. Things to look for in the landscape plan. Um, really, this is bringing everything together. What what I've kind of discussed, the uh, comparing this with uh, other plans like civil plans with pipes. You, utilities and overhead power. Um, check with the, the dimensions on here in the site plan uh, to make sure that the, the dimensions actually match this. Uh, there's a lot of times that I've come across plans that there's a berm and a, a swale in the same location that, that when you do the math that doesn't actually work. So you know it's either going up or it's going down. So it's always key to, to compare the two. Um, checking species suitability for mature size. You're looking on this landscape plan, let's make sure the, the tree is um, not too large for the, the bare minimum um, landscape terminal island that's provided. Um, and then things like I talked about, uh, checking suitability for the type of soil, the soil, soil pH, and then even things like sunlight, you know, not planting um, sunlight-loving trees on the north side of the building. <clears throat> and then, of course, the suitability for the climate zone, the too hot or too cold, too wet, too dry for the type of plants. Don't be, uh, plant um, a lot of uh, moisture-loving uh, plants in Phoenix. What you know, that's obviously not going to work as well as planting a palm tree in, in somewhere in North Dakota. So, you know, these the thing, all these things may sound you know obvious, but uh, bringing hopefully these uh, ideas to forefront today, give you some ideas on what to look for, and. Um, with that, I'll leave my information up here and pass it back to Christine. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Ted, and good afternoon again, everyone. This is Eric Tower. I'd like to conclude today's presentation with a discussion about landscaping to encourage sustainability in some not-so-common ways, mainly by touching on these three topics, green infrastructure, repurposing of stormwater, and transitional habitat. Today's seminar was about the use of landscape and sustainable environment. And while my topics are probably more related to engineers, it's important to remember that planners often have the unique role of being the middle ground or the mediator in projects. And that these topics are important to planners because the use of landscaping has a beneficial impact to a city or a community. To start, I just wanted to show that there are several organizations out there uh, and government entities that are trying to incorporate landscaping into sustainability. Now, these ideas are not just those the tree huggers speaking to you today. 
We all know LEED, of course, which is really the forefront runner in sustainable buildings. But I think it's important to note that LEED does provide credits for the use of landscaping and green infrastructure. Uh, and these are often overlooked when seeking certification. LEED, however, is not the only player in the sustainable game. Uh, SITES, for instance, is an organization that wants to provide certification to properties that use landscaping to regulate clean air and water. Uh, furthermore, states like Florida have instituted programs such as Florida Friendly, uh, something that, that uh, Ted was just talking about, which encourages developers to think about all aspects of landscaping, from water use to habitat. Associations like the ALCA, which is an equivalent to LIF in Arizona, have adopted sustainable landscape standards, and the federal government, through the EPA, of course, is creating policies and providing a lot of grant money to bring landscaping into the forefront of a sustainable conversation. So let's start with what I believe will be the next big buzzword in the sustainable conversation, and that's green infrastructure. The uh, EPA's definition is in front of you, but simply put, green infrastructure is using vegetation to help clean and process stormwater or any other contaminated water source. Its counterpart, gray infrastructure, is the existing process of storm pipes and gutters used to funnel water runoff. It's less intrusive in a community. It can provide virtually the same results that gray infrastructure treatments can have. And at the end of the day, it just costs less to build and maintain. It is virtually more appealing and can have multiple secondary effects, such as cleaner air, additional habitat, and community space. The only real knock on green infrastructure is people's unfamiliarity with it. Something that, as Laura pointed out earlier in her segment, can be a real problem in making the decision to act on sustainable design. Uh, just a couple quick case studies here um, about what's being done across the country. Uh, Philadelphia has been a nationwide leader in green infrastructure for some time now, and their current long-range plan is, is simply remarkable. Over the next 20 years, Philadelphia plans spending over a billion and a half dollars in green infrastructure improvements on things like rain gardens, green roofs, pervious pavement, uh, and things like that to irrigate trees and to um, protect with stormwater. Uh, New York has taken on a similar task as Philly. While not as all-encompassing, the argument that uh, New York is trying to make with this plan is to his residents is cost savings. Uh, this is an important selling point to what is perceived sometimes as a new and unproven technology. But in reality, these programs are just using trees to do as Mother Nature intended. I'm not going to be able to spend uh, all of today discussing the many different types of green infrastructure, but I do want to touch on green streets, which is probably the most common green infrastructure practice you have heard of. Uh, to make a street green does not involve more than just trees. It does need to make sure that the trees not only have a chance to survive, but that they're contributors to the overall appeal of the green street concept, and while serving a purpose, which is the collection and treatment of stormwater. Uh, these photos are commonly referred to as tree pits, uh, but bioretention, tree wells, rain gardens are often used to describe them as well. I feel that tree pits are a more appropriate term as they are actually lower than the grade of the sidewalk or the roadway. And what this allows for is for the roots to grow underneath the infrastructure, uh, it's more room for sidewalks and benches, uh, allows for the stormwater to actually be retained in this area, um, and of course provides that stormwater to uh, irrigate the trees instead of sprinklers. And uh, you know, now of course the trees get the chance to thrive in the environment as opposed to a smaller tree grade. Here's a construction photo of what these areas look like prior to install. Uh, what I think is important to point out is how the size of the area that these men are working on is about twice as large as what will actually be seen above ground. This is so the roots get a chance to grow within it without impacting what's above them. Municipalities, counties, and transit departments need to recognize that they are not prop they, are, they and not the property owners are the first step to creating a complete street. Government entities are going to be creating the green streets for the purpose of stormwater reduction and water purifying. But unlike gray infrastructure, which is underground and seldom seen, the green street provides that beautification that makes the street stand out. A well-landscaped street can do numerous things, from an increase in property values to reduction in speeding cars. This is a cross-section of a 6th Street in Milwaukee uh, near their airport. It's Milwaukee's first green street. The stormwater from this area flows into a place called Wilson Park Creek, which is a concrete channel for flooding as this area is prone to uh, flooding and heavy rains. 
So the goal is that this green streak can not only prevent large flooding, but also can clean the runoff that is going into the green areas. Okay, so why bother with all this stormwater stuff anyways, right? What is the purpose of creating a green streak? The answer is really in what is happening to stormwater runoff right now in that particular community. Is it being treated? Is it going right into a natural area, carrying with it its harmful chemicals and bacteria? The green infrastructure initiative may have benefits that we all can see, like a reduction in construction and maintenance costs, beautification, and so on. But its real purpose is to reduce the amount of pollution that flows into our waterways. Quantifying its ability to do this will ultimately be what makes or breaks this movement. And here we can see a nationwide view of runoff. Uh, while states such as Oregon, Washington, Florida, and New York are dealing with stormwater because of its abundance, repurposing is something that states should be considering as well. And here you can see a similarity in the areas of where surplus and deficits exist. So how much impact does stormwater runoff really have in a community? Well, as you can see in a rural area, it's about a 50-50 break between infiltration and runoff combined with um, evapotranspiration, a big word meaning water loss to the atmosphere, uh, more so in humid cases like today here in South Florida. Uh, but of course, the residential uh, low and medium density areas, you know, they have a little bit of infiltration but it's truly the urban area where you can see the difference between runoff and infiltration, with more than half the stormwater leaving the area's flow. This is really why major cities like Philadelphia and New York are taking green infrastructure so seriously. It's because there really isn't any place for the water to go due to the city's massive impervious footprint. What makes contamination a problem is that stormwater systems are designed to prevent flooding which of course is very important. In fact, I was just uh, listening today in NPR about uh, flooding concerns in, in the middle of the country. But by moving the water out as quickly as possible, we then not only lose the ability to repurpose it, but we lose the ability to treat it as well. And the problem with that, as you saw on the last slides, is that water demand in the United States has tripled over the last 30 years. Global demand doubles every 20 years. And the current stormwater practices that we have in the United States are not meant to retain. Um, I also want to point out stormwater isn't the only culprit when it comes to contaminating waterways. Residential lawn care is actually one of the largest water wasters our country is currently dealing with. Uh, now this is a last minute addition to my presentation. I noticed it last night on my way home and I just had to bring it up today. Uh, South Florida has been seeing a lot of rain the last few days. And even though it rained nonstop yesterday, the timer to this person's sprinklers wasn't turned off. Public campaigns to inform homeowners about the harmful effects of overwatering are at the early stages and not widely used. One of the biggest problems facing awareness is the harmful effects are not immediately seen by the homeowners themselves. Although I have a feeling that this guy might be noticing his water bill. Many cities have tried clever marketing as uh, catch basins and storm drains to remind residents about what happens to water and that fish and wildlife can be harmed. The state of Oregon has put a lot of effort in repurposing stormwater, and they encourage their cities to offer car wash kits for charity fundraisers. These kits funnel soapy and dirty water into a grassy area and not the drainage system. Cities like Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Clark County, Nevada, where Las Vegas is, and Stockton, California, named just a few, are also producing PSAs on their websites and their uh, local television channels, reminding people about stormwater pollution. Photographs also do wonders. Uh, many communities have taken to posting signs or displaying pictures of either pristine waterways as they should be or sometimes as they really are. Now, the perception of stormwater harvesting may seem a little like a literal drop in the bucket. Uh, I know most people perceive this as a rain barrel for grandma to use in her garden. But of course, water harvesting to irrigate trees is one of the intent of treatment. And here in South Florida, at Florida Atlantic University, my alma mater, uh, we collect rainwater to irrigate these properties. This is a new building on the Davie campus, and it estimates a 75% reduction in landscaping irrigation. Now that's not just a savings to the school, but it's also a savings in the amount of water that is wasted in lawn irrigation. Of course, cisterns have also been used for thousands of years. Uh, today, however, they're mainly used to just store water without repurposing, and irrigation needs to become a priority when using cisterns. 
I do want to bring up another repurposing effort, which is non-potable water or purple pipe. Uh, dirty water that would otherwise be discharged into a water system uh, can be reused for irrigation, agriculture, and uh, recharging groundwaters. Uh, pipe systems are completely separate from potable water. Um, however, at this time, it's not regulated by the APA, and there are still some concerns over nitrogen and phosphorus levels that could leach into the ground. Uh, Florida and California currently lead the way in the U.S. with reclaimed water. Some of the examples here in Florida, uh, St. Petersburg, for example, uh, can use reclaimed water to water over 10,000 residential lawns, 60 schools, and about 100 parks. Uh, Disney World uses reclaimed water for its cooling towers and washing vehicles. And in 2011, Florida made the third week of May Water Reuse Week. All right. Transitional habitat is a place where two natural environments meet. In our example, it's where water meets the land. What this small area of additional plants can do to the environment in terms of wildlife, water quality, and aesthetic value is amazing for the cost. These plants reduce unwanted algae, improve appearance, allow for animals to find shelter, and of course, filter harmful pollutants that would wind up in the lake. Duckweed is a common algae found in lakes where transitional habitats don't exist. This algae can completely block out the sun from the water, killing off underwater plants and the all fish living in the lake. Here's another typical example of what can happen when a transitional zone doesn't exist. All the property owners here have cut their lawns, leaving the clippings to blow into the canal. These grasses take fertilizer and other harmful chemicals with them into the lake, polluting the surface and the water. All right, it's not a planning webinar if we don't use big words. Phytoremediation is a fancy way of explaining how plants and algae use elements such as phosphorus and nitrogen, which can kill fish to, be, to their benefit. Just as we need trees to produce oxygen for us, fish need these aquatic plants to do the same for them. It's important to use native plants as exotics could also dominate the ecosystem. Aquatic plants are probably not what most people think about when discussing landscaping in a community, but it's becoming increasingly important to include them in a sustainable discussion in order to meet clean water standards. Algae is the foundation of many aquatic food chains, and their abundance ultimately determines how many fish can survive in a pond. So despite what most would think, algae is essential, but high levels of nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen can cause algae to explode, especially in ponds lacking other aquatic plants or any other type of water current. And when they become too abundant, severe oxygen problems result in death of fish. Immersed and submersed plants are critical to a well-structured pond or lake. They not only provide protection for small fish from predators, but also produce large numbers of invertebrates for small fish to eat. Plus, they're a great food source for many types of birds. And just like us, fish desire shade to get out the harshest sun rays. Sun, harsh sun rays. Water lilies and other showy flowers can not only provide this for the fish, but these plants also absorb the toxic chemicals and, of course, aesthetically pleasing. Um, there are some slightly different definitions between the freshwater and saltwater littoral zone, but since we're referring only to freshwater in our conversation, the littoral zone is simply the area in which the land meets the water, which in some situations there are shelves, such as the image on the slide above you. Here is an example of a littoral shelf. Now, this is a local park, and uh, most lakes or ponds do not need this level of transitional zone, but this serves as a nice reference and shows how a planted littoral zone can work. Here are two typical types of storm retention systems, dry and wet. Both serve only one purpose, which is to store stormwater. In the conversation of repurposing stormwater, we need to begin discussing turning storm ponds into a multifaceted area that can serve the community with more than just one purpose. In fact, recent research in Minnesota has shown that storm ponds cannot just remain idle, as years of use can compound toxic chemicals into the sediment. These chemicals are heavy and tend to sink in ponds where there's no current. Essentially, years of buildup can make these ponds inefficient. Uh, Minnesota has actually just realized that cleanups to storm bonds may actually cost up to a billion dollars. Uh, here in Florida, the state is taking some preemptive steps to help natural areas uh, that could uh, be the end user of storm systems by creating more storm ponds. Uh, the storm ponds that are going to be part of this program actually do have a landscaping element in them. So one of the solutions to stagnant storm ponds is the use of aquatic plants for phytoremediation. 
Uh, now we get to use the word bioswales. Uh, so bioswales have been mostly linear green spaces, usually adjacent to a roadway, but the premise is exactly the same, and it can be used for larger pond areas. Again, by doing this, we are cleaning the water, ultimately flowing into our natural areas, increasing the lifespan of a storm pond, and possibly creating new habitats. Here's a sign, an informational sign that was posted outside of a recently uh, installed bioswale, and this is great education to the public to show uh, the reason for why they did it. I want to just provide a few websites that we use in today's uh, conversation uh, that you might want to uh, visit uh, in learning about uh, green infrastructure and some things we talked about today. There is actually a Green Infrastructure Foundation. Uh, Urban Forest Coalition is uh, part of uh, ISA, and uh, this is a great resource if you are looking to, uh, for ideas on uh, planting uh, in an urban environment. They also have a lot of uh, great statistics on trees and their effect of urban environments. Uh, LEED, of course, we're aware of. Um, I want to bring up again that you know, LEED has uh, hundreds of credit points, and uh, a lot of them we talk about uh, but some of them are really not used, and the ones that I feel are not used and we discuss more do involve not just the green infrastructure, but also landscaping. Finally, shameless plug, Landscape Inspectors Association of Florida. Uh, our website is available to help you uh, here in Florida to learn about uh, the, the process of grades and standards, and uh, has a lot of resources here, here for Florida. In conclusion, it's important to remember what sustainability is. It's about ensuring that resources we have today will be available for tomorrow. Integration of different green spaces, as the quote says, is going to be one of the tools that we need to use to make our community sustainable. And it's up to us to make sure that landscaping stays in that conversation of a sustainable community. Uh, thank you, and I will now turn it over to Christine. Wonderful. Uh, Eric, Laura, and Ted, thank you. Let's jump right into questions. We have a host of them that I've been gathering throughout the presentation. The first one is for Laura. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what a clear zone is? Um, seven foot clear distance seems pretty drastic. That would prevent many, if not most, city trees. I am not understanding what a clear zone is. Can you talk a little more about that? Um. Well, the clear zone is, is really the, the room that the root need to grow at least in the foreseeable future. And yes, a lot of cities have a lot smaller you know, in width, uh, you know, whatever strip this is. But the only way around um, and in a smaller uh, environment is, is now doing human measures, which include root barriers. Um, chemical root barriers, either physical or, or chemical barriers, or like I talked about with structural soils and, and tree wells that go underneath pavement. That's a lot more money. That's why it's not as popular, but obviously it, it can be done. There's a lot of cities that have very small, uh, lack of a better word, landscape strips in the, the streets, and that's why there, it's more costly to do, but when there is uh, upfront planning, the seven foot minimum is really, really what is required by any tree. Um, if it's plants, shrubs, four feet minimum. <clears throat> I don't know if that answers the question for you, Christine. That's great. Thank you. Um, can anyone speak about any experience or success with silva cells for the underground part of a tree root system? Have you had any experience or successes? The S I L V A. S I L V A. S I L V A. That sounds like a uh, specific, either trademark name or a company name. So um, I need Eric's doing a quick search on the internet. <laughs> What? Maybe. Oh, they're just, they're just, they're just oh, oh. plates. Okay, yeah. there you go. Actually, I brought up a slide. Um, I don't know if Silva is a brand name, but um, I just I had I actually showed a slide of the uh, underground of a of a tree um, a tree pit, and you know most urban areas 
if you go out today, you'll see a tree grate. You'll see a tree. You'll see a little bit of a metal container right around the tree. Uh, sometimes hardly any room for that tree to grow. And uh, what we've learned from years of that is that the, the tree roots, you know, they're looking for air. They're looking for, to breathe. And so they want to move upward. And what happens is, uh, you know, they'll push up the sidewalks, they push up the pavers and things like that. So these types of grates allow the roots to grow in sort of an intrinsic fashion and uh, kind of um, remediates their want to drive upwards and, and pushing into the um, pushing into the sidewalks and the roads. And that's why they're being used more often. And they're, no, they're, um, they definitely should be used. Um, and before we get too far away, we had a couple of people type in um, about a clear zone. The phrase clear zone is also sometimes used by highway engineers to describe an area adjacent to a roadway where trees and poles are prohibited as part of a misguided safety effort. Uh, and then clear zone is also referred to as green strip or parkway. It refers to the landscape strip between the sidewalk and the curb in a street. Um, yeah, I guess it, this is Ted again. Is, um, clear zones, I, I mean, I guess could be interchangeable in other areas with side distance triangles. What we use here, that's a, uh, a triangle, if you will, of a certain distance by a certain distance away from a, a public right-of-way. For example, 30 feet by 30 feet. Um, here, at least, well, in the city, it's, it, it, trees are allowed in that zone, but not bushes, uh, shrubs between uh, three feet and eight feet. But yes, uh, Department of Transportation sometimes require quote clear zones. You know, anywhere within uh, 150 feet of a nose of a, a landscape of an island. It's not now. It's not a landscape island. It's just basically a grass island. So, um, yes, there's a lot of DOTs that are uh, making it illegal to have trees. <laughs> um, and just now, the, the the person who asked the question about Silva cells says uh, that they're a product that's used in urban streetscapes to allow tree roots to grow under pavement and can also accommodate stormwater storage. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, uh, next question. Laura talks about the commitment to chemical-free wands. Ted mentions using chemical applications for the pest management of trees. Um, the question asked, would Laura provide some suggestions for Ted to consider to reduce the use of chemicals on trees? Um, so I guess the question more is, um, if we're talking about commitments to reduce chemicals that can drain you know, into our stormwater, uh, how, how do we talk about, at the same time, using pest management to, to keep our trees? Well. I guess I, I would start with the fact that, um, you know, we go back to using the, the right tree in the right place um, by, by planning sustainable landscapes. We're, we're going to have a, a lot uh, fewer pest issues um, and need fewer chemicals. Um, so I, I, would start, I would start with that. Um, did you want to add to that, Ted? Yes, actually it was misunderstood what I said was that we do not, we want to use natural processes and not chemical um, applications. That's, that's the opposite of what we want to do. We want to use, conserve by using beneficial insects and also natural, quote, uh, pesticides, but that's, that's not quite what, you know, it, it's obviously um, the, the reverse of what we were talking about. We definitely don't want that. <clears throat> Okay. Um, are there any good case studies of communities which have eliminated leaf pickup? That's a great question. I, I'm not aware of any myself. Um, going through my, in California, there's a lot of uh, leaf recycle programs during the fall in, in, in at least Northern California where in the Sacramento region, there's a lot of um, uh, London paint, plane trees, sweet gums. They drop their leaves in the fall. That's when there's a, an extra push for a green waste program. There's also 
a uh, frequent pickup of green waste in Sacramento. Um, I forget the, how, how often. It was at least uh, twice a month, if not once a week. You could have your green waste picked up at the curb <clears throat> in clear bags. I'm an Floridian. I wasn't aware that trees that leaves fall from trees. Apparently, this is the northern thing. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> and okay. Eric got kicked out of the room. I know. <laughs> um, okay. This is a good question. We're working on a new landscape regulation for our city. One question we had was what kind of level of qualifications should we require for those persons preparing our landscape plan? Well, there's a, a different um, levels of, of uh, qualification. It depends on if the goal is later on for inspections. I know Eric here is jumping up and down to, to push the Landscape Inspectors Association. But the uh, having some level of Landscape architect experience is what we look for in, in my city, as well as um, also having being a certified arborist is is very uh, beneficial. Having some some type of green industry um, experience or qualifications would be key. But people who are more hands-on are um, you know site planners who who also uh, worked very closely with. Um, you know, landscape plans and um, other um, professional entities um, that I talked about, and even engineering companies and architects, they, they're frequently overlapping. So um, out of the ranking like that, arborist, landscape architect, and then maybe engineer and, and uh, someone with landscape inspection experience is, is, is very beneficial. Great. Um, this question is specifically for Laura, and Laura, I don't know if you can pull your slides back up. We can change the screen settings so that we can see our slides. Um, can you explain why the water quality of the pond in the Florida slide example was so apparent from the aerial photo? Uh, this was way back in the very beginning of your presentation. Um, yeah, it was pretty poor water quality. Um, let me see if I can pull this up here for you. If you can pull it up, I'll change the, the screen presentation to you so that we can all see it. Um, okay, I'm there. Okay. Actually, it was a... Um, it was a four or five year old kid who first picked this out of this picture to say, well, look at that house, or look at this house, there's no landscaping around it. But um, uh, basically, um, oh, this is a neighborhood that's actually not too far from uh, the Everglades in South Florida. And um, you see there's a lot of turf grass, and um, possibly, uh, assumably, I guess, a lot of uh, fertilizer being used on the turf grass and nothing to really stop it. So um, with that extra nitrogen added to the water, we, we see a lot of uh, water quality issues. So it's not so much what the water looks like from the aerial, it's, I guess, the things that we don't see around the body of water that sort of tells us what the water well, quality might be? It's, I mean, you can see it's kind of the, the murky green color. It's full of algae, which has been stimulated by that, that extra nitrogen that isn't meant to be there. Um, it's just, you know, it's not a low-level problem. It's something that's, you know, the, this photo was taken from um, a helicopter. So it's, um, when you can notice the, the poor water quality from this far away, it's, it's pretty bad. If I can just chime in for one moment, what you notice about that is there's no water current in that particular area. It, it looks as if the water flow channels into this kind of a back lake and is nowhere else for it to go. So the algae bloom is going to occur. Um, I did bring up transitional habitat, and uh, this is one of those examples in which transitional habitat and the use of aquatic uh, plants uh, could remediate this problem. Uh, I don't know if you notice above uh, in the top of the slide, this is obviously a golf course. 
Um, you know, unfortunately, golf courses use a lot of fertilizers, pesticides, and other chemicals to uh, to keep the course in top condition. And uh, this is one of the things that we're, we're kind of we're talking about in protecting our waterways and keeping our waterways uh, clean. Um, you know, if there isn't anything uh, landscape-wise, landscape material in that water to try and eliminate those toxins, then that's what's going to happen. Great, thank you. Um, just a few more questions. Um, this one is, I guess, just for the group. Is it better to have many small trees or fewer larger trees in the urban landscape? Well, I, I mean, that's very subjective. It's Ted again. Um, I, I'd prefer... I prefer, I mean, here's my opinion. I prefer larger trees and less of them, but in South Florida, we're forced with a lot of overhead power lines, so we have more mix of larger trees away from the power lines and perimeters and smaller trees that um, are uh, closer together, um, maybe 20 feet on center instead of 25, 30 feet on center for the large tree. So um, I think the, the trees that grow larger is not only aesthetically look better, but um, those trees in itself do a lot more, um, you know, uh, flood prevention and uptake of water and, and all everything we're talking about, plus um, uh, carbon sequestering um, with the the larger tree canopy. So um, and of course most um, areas. Uh, native trees are, are larger in itself. The other ones are, are more mid-level trees. And just to actually just to add on a little bit to that, um, I would probably go with large trees myself. It's a quantity versus quality decision. Uh, with larger trees, you have the ability for more habitat for animals, uh, birds, examples. Um, and you have the ability for, for them to, uh, to utilize that space. You know, uh, native uh, no matter what we do, whether we're making it as uh, a native landscape or it's just in the front of our home, nature's going to find its way there, and uh, we want to try and, and make it possible for them to be able to survive. Great. Laura, were you going to say anything before we move on? Oh, well, I was going to interject. Um, my my preference is to uh, kind of maximize the, the canopy coverage as much as possible. Uh, so if a big tree is going to fit and thrive, that's great. But um, you know, if the, the space is more appropriate for a smaller tree, I'd I'd go that route. But uh, the the more canopy coverage while while you're maintaining diversity of species is, in my opinion, ideal. So we have okay. no consensus. <laughs> Great. Um, this is uh, the age-old question. I'm surprised it took this long to pop up as a question. Has there been an economic evaluation of sustainable landscape versus cost of a traditional lawn? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> there, there has. Uh, I mean, it's there's in addition to uh, real estate organizations. Uh, trying to quantify that is difficult, but there's been national studies and organizations that don't come to mind at this moment. But um, I, I believe the ISA's website, if someone wants to check that out, it, there are links, and one of those links is, is going to be the um, economic benefits, and they have been quantified in values. Um, you know, even uh, like uh, Eric has the Urban Forest Coalition. Uh, website. So, for example, one of them quantified the number of um, pounds, million pounds of tons of uh, carbon sequestered per year in a large city like New York City, and it's billions upon billions of dollars. And if you divide that by number of properties, you know, you get individual property benefits. So, um, yes, there's there are plenty of studies out there to use. Yeah, I'd say there's plenty of studies. Um, unfortunately, there are not. There's just probably not the same um, the same way of creating the same study over and over again. When a study is done, a lot of times what we see is uh, they they divide a different formula to to do the math, and so a lot of times there isn't that comparison. 
Um, but uh, Washington, D.C. actually just this year completed a study, uh, an intensive study, and supposedly the information is going to be out either later this year or next year. And um, I'll, I'll add to that as well. Um, a, a smaller sc a study that's taken place here on campus at the University of Florida um, on Florida-friendly landscapes. So for those of you who don't know, it's our kind of our, our branding of um, uh, sustainable, environmentally friendly landscapes. Uh, some of my colleagues are comparing um, the, the time and costs associated with a, a more traditional residential landscape versus a uh, Florida friendly landscape. And um, uh, some of the preliminary uh, data show that initially the time can actually be more intensive because you're hand weeding, uh, that type of thing. But then the, the water savings is, um, has been uh, just under half, I believe, or close to half for the, the more environmentally friendly landscape. So um, definitely fewer inputs over the long run. Great. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, so we, we want to know, in, in one of the slides, you, you showed those um, fun gutters. And we want to know where the fish-shaped storm grates are, are coming from and uh, how, how the cost is compared to traditional gutters. Is this more of a public art installment connection or, you know, is this solely through the regional stormwater? You know, where, who, who does those and how expensive are they and where do we get them? <laughs> well, they could be as simple as spray paint. Um, public works departments typically are the ones who are doing that. Uh, most of those photographs were from Oregon and Washington. Ted, did you want to? Yeah, well, I know it for direct uh, uh, experience in, in Northern California, a lot of the drainage districts have those that they're actually they're they're construction constructed for them. Um, so I'm sure there are companies who are used to um, making these and will be willing to ship them anywhere in the country from right, right. <laughs> Portland, Washington, or California. <laughs> so just Google fish-shaped storm grates and see what comes up. Yeah, so they're they're have lots of happy faces on them. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there were many many more examples out there. Well, I think this is a good time then to end our presentation. So we have some food for thought for the rest of this weekend. Um, so Eric Power and Laura Warner and Ted Kozak and the Florida chapter of APA, thank you for joining us today. This was very informative. Um, and interesting. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. And to all of those Miami Heat lovers, um, I have to say go Cavs as a Clevelander. And everyone have a great weekend. I don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you said that. How You must not have known I was from Cleveland. <laughs> it's painful. All right, everyone, have a really great weekend. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Christine. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.